Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Bazam Zawadi. You're most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum, Paul. Thanks for having me. Wa salam. For those who don't know, uh, Bassam is a Muslim author who writes extensively about issues related to Islamic apologetics and Islamic modernist discourse. Bassam's work can, can be found at calltomonotheism.com, his academia page, and his blog, islamicdiscourse.substack. Now, I will link to all these platforms in the description below, so just click on them um, and explore these excellent resources. He also has a master's degree in philosophy and ethics. Today, Bassam will be discussing an Islamic response to the argument from divine hiddenness. Now, I just want to give viewers uh, the heads up at this point. This is uh, an advanced academic discussion uh, that will be quite at home in a university setting. We will make uh, we will do our very best, though, to make it clear. So the intention is to uh, communicate the substance rather than just kind of uh, go on and, and with, disregarding that. So would you like to introduce us to the topic, Bassam? Great. Absolutely. Uh, let me let me just share my presentation. Mm. All right. Can you see that clearly? Perfect. Yep. Very, very clear. Right. All right. Bismillah. So uh, inshallah today mm. I'll be offering a critique of a popular philosophical argument against the existence of God. It's mm. the argument from divine hiddenness. Now, in popular discourse, we all may have come across various forms of this argument, where the gist of it pretty much amounts to the critic saying, if God exists, he wouldn't be hidden from me. He would have made his existence abundantly clear to me. And since he doesn't, that indicates that he doesn't exist. However, today we'll be focusing on a more philosophically complex argument than this. The most mm -hmm. popular form of this argument in the literature was articulated and popularized by a Canadian philosopher called John Schellenberg. And he's still alive today. Um, Schellenberg has written books and articles focusing on this argument, and he has struggled to make it robust by defending it from ample and forceful criticism. So what is the argument from divine hiddenness? Mm. Schellenberg presents his argument in a syllogistic format, whereby he makes a number of claims in the form of premises out of which he then attempts to deduce the conclusion that God does not exist. Mm. So let us take a look at his syllogistic argument <clears throat> and yeah. try to understand the points it's trying to convey. So I will first read it out. I'll first read it out. Then in subsequent slides, I'll explain each of the points inshallah. So don't worry if you don't fully digest it as I'm reading it out first. Right, okay, that sounds like a plan. So, the first premise of the argument is, if a perfectly loving God exists, then there exists a God who is always open to a personal relationship with any finite person. Premise two, if there exists a God who is always open to a personal relationship with any finite person, then no finite person is ever non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. Premise three, <clears throat> if a perfectly loving God exists, then no finite person is ever non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. And this premise flows out from premises one and two. Yep. Premise four, some finite persons are or have been non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. Premise five, no perfectly loving God exists. And this flows out from premises three and four. Mm. Premise six, if no perfectly loving God exists, 
then God does not exist. <clears throat> Conclusion, God does not exist. Flowing out from premises 5 and 6. So now let me try to provide further elaboration of each of these individual premises so that we represent Schellenberg properly here before we move on to offering a critique. Mm. So the first premise, if a perfectly loving God exists, then there exists a God who is always open to a personal relationship with any finite person. Under this premise, Schellenberg is trying to communicate a number of things. First, God is unsurpassably loving and caring. In other words, no being could ever be more loving or caring than God. Secondly, God as a perfectly loving being is expected to value the relationship for its own sake. So God would have created human beings for such a relationship. God hmm. is not seeking a relationship with human beings primarily out of desiring something in return, but rather appreciates and values the relationship inherently for its own sake. And because God values such relationships so considerably, he is always open and receptive to having a personal relationship with people. Mm. Thirdly, analogous to a mother's love for her child, God's love toward his creation entails, one, providing them with immediate responses to their requests, two, sparing them of any needless trauma and fostering their physical and spiritual well-being, three, not encouraging them to have misleading thoughts about their relationship with God. Four, desiring a personal interaction with them whenever possible. Five, longing for personal interaction with them if it is ever absent. So here we can see that Schellenberg is making some serious assumptions about what perfect divine love entails. It should be so perfect, according to Schellenberg, it should be so perfect beyond anything we can imagine. God's love for us should surpass that of a mother for her own child. Just as a mother would not make her child feel unloved or have doubts about his mother's love for him, similarly, mm -hmm. God should never let someone he desires to have a relationship with have doubts about God's love for them. That would also include doubts about his existence or true identity. Is he the Islamic God? Is he the Christian God? Who, who is the true God? Etc. None of this should be hidden from or be made unclear to the person by God. Second premise. If there exists a God who is always open to a personal relationship with any finite person, then no finite person is ever non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. Schellenberg is trying to relay, communicate, convey a couple of points here. First, personal relationship means a conscious, interactive, and positively meaningful relationship between God and the individual. So both parties must be aware and conscious of the fact that they have a relationship with each other. Secondly, non-resistance entails that non-belief in God is not due to any emotional or behavioral opposition towards God. So essentially what Schellenberg is trying to say here is that as long mm -hmm. as the non-believer mm -hmm. is sincere and is not intentionally opposing God, or in Muslim vocabulary, he's not consciously committing kufr, then God must be open to having a loving relationship with this non-believer. So he's basically saying, if the kafir is sincere, he's not intentionally and consciously rejecting God, resisting God, then God should be in a loving relationship with this individual the gist of what he's trying to say. Premise three. If a perfectly loving God exists, then no finite person 
is ever non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. So in light of premises one and two, Schellenberg is making a strong claim here. What he's claiming is the following. There cannot be any instant of time when non-resistant people do not believe in God and have a personal relationship with him. So according to Schellenberg, if God is perfectly loving, then he must immediately, without hesitation and delay, seek to establish a relationship with all human beings as long as they are not consciously committing kufr or being resistant to God. According to Schellenberg, not only are there not any good reasons for God not guiding non-resistant non-believers, but it's also problematic for God to even delay having a human being such a human being, a non-resistant human being, become guided by him. Even if God postpones the guidance of a sincere person by a couple of weeks, then this is still problematic, according to <clears throat> Schellenberg. Mm. Just as a loving mother wouldn't intentionally hide from her child and cause him distress for even an hour, then God is supposed to be even more loving than our mother's and should not even postpone the guidance of such sincere people for even a second. According to Schellenberg, a human being who is not resisting God shouldn't be spending years researching and traversing the path to attain divine truth. No, because just as a mother would not intentionally postpone connecting and bonding with her child whom she loves dearly, even more so, God would not or should not, according to Schoenberg, delay establishing a relationship with non-resistant, non-believers that he supposedly perfectly loves. And even if you try to respond to Schoenberg by arguing that there could be legitimate reasons why God does not instantly bond with his non-resistant servants, like, say, for example, um, God giving human beings free will to discover God, as opposed to God forcibly bonding with human beings by manipulating their beliefs about him. And as a mm. result of having free will, human beings may take their time to come to know God and so on. Schoenberg would still disagree and insist that such goods cannot outweigh the importance of a relationship with God. And that God, given his perfect love, must only seek goods that are relationship compatible. So Schellenberg would say that even if he were to grant, for the sake of argument, that human beings being given free will necess necessarily entails that God won't instantly have a relationship with them when they are non-resistant, he would still insist that <clears throat> God, as a perfectly loving being, ought not to give human beings free will then. Schellenberg is very rigid and unrelenting when it comes to what he believes must be the implications and concomitants of being a perfectly loving being, and as a result, will not accept any justification that would result in providing a conceptualization and understanding of perfect divine love that does not align with his understanding. Just to clarify, just to say, just pausing here, if I may, Bassem. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Schellenberg himself, he's an atheist. I mean, he's actual. He is an atheist, yes. Right. So he's not arguing from, uh, say, a Christian position. I mean, it, it, obviously, his argument is based wholly on Christian presuppositions. It's very distinctly Christian argument, you know, God just being loving and having a personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, with God. It's, th th this is a uh, standard evangelical, Christian, anthropomorphic. Uh, you know, um, uh, assumptions of his argument, but but he's actually not buying any of that anyway. He's an atheist. So it's, uh, yeah, that coming before, before you, also you've got to critique this from an Islamic perspective. It just strikes me as, as interesting. An atheist is expending so much energy here and mm. teasing out what it means to be a loving God, but he doesn't even believe God exists in the first place. Yeah, yeah anyway. absolutely. I, I mean, if I were to speak in uh, Schoenberg's uh, defense, I would say, yes, part, uh, th there is a good amount of, Christian presuppositions in his argument, but what Schellenberg 
does say um, that might be uh, you know receptive to us Muslims is that he's granting the idea that it's it's okay to accept the idea that God does not love those who reject him. While you'll find many Christians that would say that God loves everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So so Schoenberg would say, look, um, all I am trying to say is that as long as people are not resisting God, he should love them. So it's not as radical as the Christian conception of God, um, even though we might still have some disagreements, but uh but you know it it's, yeah. it's a bit more uh it's not it, it's not as straightforward to refute if we were to deal with with, with the christian position okay which, which is more intuitively wrong the, you know the whole idea of god loving everyone unconditionally but but we won't step into that uh yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. okay thank you great um so premise four so here in premise four um some finite persons are or have been non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. So here in premise four, Schellenberg is saying that, well, there are non-resistant non-believers. We know that there are people out there who non-resistantly disbelieve in God. Due to genuine... this, this expression non-resistant, he keeps it keeps coming up like a mantra, uh, as if it's self-evident. Um, I, I would question that. Um, this is a very unusual way of expressing the issue. Um, is this something you're going to unpack later, or is it worth just dwelling on what he means by non-resistantly in a bit more detail here? Um, but basically, uh, for non-resistant for him, and and I think we'll be touching on it a little bit more. I mean, I'll be critiquing uh, his. Of, you know his idea that, your, 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 that your, non-resistance your, 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 somehow entails that people are not culpable. I'll be I'll be touching upon that, but basically non-resistant okay. for him is that the person is not consciously and willfully uh, rejecting God. So the person is not is, is not saying to himself, you know what, I am yeah. intentionally <laughs> rejecting the truth here. I know I am rejecting the truth. That's non-resistance for for Schellenberg, pretty much. Okay, thank you. Premise five, no perfectly loving God exists. And so here in premise five, which flows out of premises three and four, we see that no perfectly loving God exists. This is because, according to Schellenberg, the existence of non-resistant non-believers is mutually exclusive to the existence of a perfectly loving God who should have instantly guided these people. And therefore, there should not you should not be able to count to ten. And with someone out there being a non-resistant non-believer, right? Pretty much. I mean, I, I don't even want to caricature his view, but is is pretty much how radical it is. Mm -hmm. um, premise six: If no perfectly loving God exists, then God does not exist. And so, when we come to premise six, Schellenberg is ahead of a non sequitur and a, lot, a big assumption because obviously the other models of God that could be uh, discussed that are not premised on this idea of it having to be perfectly loving, of course. Absolutely. Sorry, I'm, I'm anticipating perhaps what you're going to say, but it just strikes me as a, a complete non sequitur, number six. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so number six. And so when we come to premise six, um, Schellenberg argues that since a perfectly loving God does not exist, then God himself does not exist. Okay. Why not? Well, because God, by very definition, is perfect. And if one can demonstrate that it's impossible for a perfect God to exist, then by default he has shown God himself to not exist. Therefore, the conclusion, which flows out of premises 5 and 6, God does not exist. So, just to recap and summarize everything that has, that has been said, the gist of Schillenberg's argument is that a perfectly loving God must instantly without even a minute's delay, mm. form bonds and relationships with human beings who do not intentionally resist him, who do not intentionally commit kufr. And since we know that there are non-resistant, non-believers out there, this would mean that God himself does not exist. And Schellenberg is basing his argument on two major 
points or assumptions. The first one is a loving relationship with God is the greatest good. Thus, no other good could possibly warrant the delay of it coming to fruition. So Schellenberg will not accept any possible reason or excuse for why God could or would temporarily delay the guidance of non-resistant non-believers. Secondly, non-resistance entails that this is both the ideal and required time for God to guide the non-believer by entering into a loving relationship with him. According to Schellenberg, if a human being is not resisting God, then what is God waiting for to guide him? Non-resistance, according to Schellenberg, demands that God, according to his perfectly loving nature, immediately guides the individual and forms a loving relationship with him. Inshallah, I'll be critiquing both of these points to mm. undercut Schellenberg's argument. Mm -hmm. However, before I present my unique Islamic response, um, it would be useful to briefly mention the several responses, which are pretty good, I would admit, that philosophers have already provided to Schellenberg in the literature. You know, and philosophers have mainly, who are critiquing Schellenberg, have mainly focused on trying to offer justifiable reasons for what for why God could postpone the guidance of a non-resistant non-believer. They can be summarized as follows. Waiting for the person to have the correct motives to believe in God. So for example, it could be the case that you have a non-resistant non-believer who does want to believe in God, but maybe not for the right reason. Perhaps he genuinely wants to find God so that he can marry the girl of his dreams who insists that he becomes a believer before they get married. Well, perhaps God is postponing to guide him until his motives are sound, even though he is not actively resisting God. Respecting moral autonomy by waiting for the person to freely believe in God. We spoke about this earlier. This is the point of free will. If people truly have free will, then to speak of God instantly guiding them without allowing them to exercise their judgments, to search for the truth and undergo the process uh, and, and journey of investigation to attaining the truth would compromise their freedom and moral autonomy. Three, allowing the person's intensity of desire for God to develop further. Perhaps God is postponing the guidance of a certain individual because that individual's passion and yearning to discover God's revealed truth isn't at an ideal place just yet. Now, sure, the person is not actively resisting God, but his determination and resolve to seek God are still underwhelming and requires further development. Uh, you know, us, us Muslims, we refer to a kind of kufr known as kufr al-i'rab, which we can translate into apathyism. Apathyism. An apathyist is one who does not care about God and whether he exists. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he may not consciously be rejecting what he knows to be the true religion of God, but he also doesn't really care if there is such a true religion of God to begin with. Yes. And this is a huge problem with Schellenberg's presupposition, whereby he thinks that such people aren't morally culpable or blameworthy simply because they are not consciously rejecting God Intentional. Fourthly, letting the person's understanding of God deepen more accurately. It could be that certain people don't fully appreciate and fathom the majesty and beauty of God, and that a little more time is required 
for them to be better informed of the infinite greatness of God and why it's absolutely essential to seek God before God chooses to guide them. And this is even if they are not consciously resisting God. Waiting for the person to fulfill certain conditions, such as repentance of previously committed sins. You can have a person who is not actively resisting God anymore, but he has not repented or felt any remorse for the insincerity or resistance that he used to exhibit prior. Repentance and remorse over the wrong that we used to do are essential for spiritual character building. And it could very well be that God deems the reaching of an appropriate spiritual state to be the ideal time to guide the person. Six, waiting for the person's love for God to become more genuine. This is very similar to the apathist example I just alluded to. A person who might not be rejecting God, but he may also not be holding positive feelings for him either. Such a person who is emotionally ambivalent about God may not be ready for a loving relationship with him and will thus remain unguided. Seventhly, encouraging the pursuit of virtue by allowing non-resistant people to traverse the path of seeking God. The very journey of sincerely and genuinely seeking God, which involves researching and contemplating and inquiring all for the sake of discovering religious truth, is an amazing act in and of itself. Yeah. But this remarkable journey apparently has no place in Schellenberg's view, since this entire journey constitutes God delaying the guidance of that sincere person. And so Schellenberg rejects all these reasons that I just mentioned by either saying that they are less important than the loving relationship God is expected to establish with these individuals, or that these reasons are not mutually exclusive to God instantly establishing a loving relationship with these individuals. Hmm. So in other words, according to Schellenberg, God is powerful enough to respect people's free will and all these other reasons that were just mentioned without having to compromise on instantly postponing these people, uh, postponing guiding these people into a loving relationship with him. And if it's not possible, well, Schoenberg would insist that these reasons are not so important yeah. to the yeah. point that it would warrant delaying guiding the non-resistant, non-believer. Mm. So now we come to the section where I provide my response. And, you know, I spent a good amount of time you know, so far, just trying to explain Schellenberg's, um, you know, position, because I really want to make sure that we're not straw manning him, we're not caricaturing his argument, and, uh, you know, I do apologize to the listeners if I came across as repetitive, but I really wanted to ingrain and and reemphasize certain positions that he's, and assumptions that he's holding so that we properly understand his argument and that we be fair and sympathetic when it comes to our critique. Now, mm. we come to the section where I provide my response to this argument. I want to critique the two underlying assumptions of Schellenberg's argument. But before I give my direct critiques, I need to give a critical build up to them. So now here, I am going to propose an Islamic response that explains why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have chosen to create inculpable or blameless non-believers. Yeah. And then after I, I present this response, I'll examine Schellenberg's two assumptions to see whether my response could sufficiently withstand their argumentative force. Yeah. So Allah created the Ahlul Fatra. So who are the Ahlul Fatra? The Ahlul Fatra are those non-believers who did not accept Islam, either because they received a fundamentally distorted picture of it without 
reasonable access to a true representation of it, or they did not receive the message of Islam at all. The Ahlul Fatra will be tested in the afterlife. According to a hadith by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Ahlul Fatra will be given a special test, excuse me, will be given a special test by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife. They will be commanded by Allah to enter the hellfire. And if they do so, it will become cool and not harm them. Similar to how when Prophet Ibrahim السلام, entered the fire and it did not harm him. If they refuse to obey this command, they will fail the test and they will enter hell. Now, one may ask, isn't this a very psychologically difficult test? Well, as scholars such as Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Kathir and others commented, these sorts of commands are at times issued by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, Allah tested Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam when it came to whether he should slaughter his son. Another example is that Allah will command all of us in the afterlife to cross the sirat, which is a bridge over hell. And depending on the state of our iman and good deeds, we may traverse that bridge as quickly as a lightning bolt, or we may cross it slowly. Similarly, when it comes to the Ahlul Fatra, we need to consider whether they sufficiently exerted their physical and intellectual capacities in this life while still failing to attain the truth. Or were they the kind of people who were apathists, who willingly remained ignorant? And even if they were to have received the correct message of Islam in an undistorted form, they would have still rejected. So what was their spiritual disposition? Was their spiritual disposition already inclined to reject God anyway? And so, depending on the kind of Ahlul Fatra the individual was in this, in this life, that would surely factor into how he would perform in the test in the afterlife. So just as Prophet Ibrahim السلام, was in such a strong spiritual state to pass Allah's test, and just as many Muslims will be at a spiritual level to pass the sirat quickly, similarly, some of these Ahlul Fatra individuals will pass that test in the afterlife easily depending on their efforts and sincerity. Allah knows best. All we could say for certain is that Allah will judge these people fairly. But there's still the question, why create the Ahlul Fatra to begin with? Schellenberg will ask us, wait a minute, why is God delaying guiding the Ahlul Fatra and entering into a loving relationship with them until after they die and after they pass the test in the afterlife? Well, I'll argue that one possible reason why Allah created the Ahlul Fatra is to demonstrate, is to dem to demonstrate to Muslims the importance of da'wah. It is to undercut any possible excuse for not doing da'wah by saying things like, you know, what's what's the point of da'wah when everyone's already received the message of Islam? Mm -hmm. Or what's the point of giving da'wah when people would just reject it anyways? And so on. By Allah letting us know that the Ahlul Fatra do exist, He is reminding us and letting us know that there are people out there who need da'wah. And giving da'wah is a religious obligation upon the ummah. And if there are Ahlul Fatra who were not preached to, then Muslims could possibly be held accountable for why that is the case. Mm -hmm. why, is it, why is it the case that there are sincere people in the world who did not receive the message of Islam properly? Was it due to some inability on the collective Muslim part? Or was it due to negligence uh, by Muslims who had the ability to give da'wah, but chose not to? Now, we won't get into these details, but it could very well be the case that one of the reasons why Allah created the Ahlul Fatra is as a means to test us Muslims 
who are supposed to obey Allah's command to spread the message of Islam to everyone. Now, how does what I just said hold up in the face of Schellenberg's two assumptions? So now we will move on to directly critique his two assumptions. So what was the first assumption again? First assumption was a loving relationship with God is the greatest good. Thus, no other good could possibly warrant the delay of it hmm. coming to fruition. So, in light of this assumption, Schellenberg would argue that the reason that I just gave for why Allah could have created the Ahl al-Fatra, whom Schellenberg would consider to be non-resistant non-believers, isn't good enough. Why? Because, according to Schellenberg, it's more important and valuable that God immediately establishes a, love, a loving relationship with the sincere Ahl al-Fatra, rather than temporarily postponing that relationship till after they die and pass the test in the afterlife. Well, first, I have, you know, I have two responses to this. Now, first of all, we cannot discern all moral goods attainable behind a divine action. So we are in no place to say what or how many morally praiseworthy wisdoms or goods, as Schoenberg calls it, goods, are actualized behind God's actions. So God may choose not to reveal any or all of these matters to us. Right? So first of all, we need to embrace some humility when it comes to thinking we are in some position to confidently assess what is more suitable or, for, or, for, or fitting for God to do and not do. As if we know, as if we're if in we a position. If I, if I could just interrupt there. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was saying I mean, this, this is a very good point, and it's found in the Quran, of course. I mean, the story of um, uh, a Moses, peace be upon him, and the you know, meeting this mysterious stranger, and Moses being tested, and you know, the, the moral being that we can't actually always understand um, God's actions in this world because it's in the unseen realm, but we should have patience and so on. And uh, this is a, a fundamental truth of, of Islam, of course. And uh, this whole this whole argument from um, uh, the, the, this uh, Canadian uh, philosopher is. is it's based on a kind of logic which is not rooted in revelation at all. It, it's based on his own assumptions about what is and what isn't reasonable, completely divorced from uh, God's uh, disclosure of his purposes. And, and that is a very kind of artificial, secular way of approaching the subject, which I find it quite unsatisfying in a way. But um, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. No, no. I, yeah. So I, and that, that's a good segue to my second point, right? Schellenberg's method of assessing moral goods yeah, lacks a, objectivity. Yeah, Exactly, exactly. Nowhere has Schellenberg actually <laughs> properly laid out an objective method of yeah. determining the value of moral goods. Exactly. Schellenberg continues to insist that the moral value of God instantly establishing a loving relationship with a non-resistant non-believer is hmm. vastly greater than all the possible benefits yeah. and wisdoms for why God could temporarily postpone he just asserts it. it if it's self-evidence, and it's not given the multiplicity of alternative scenarios which you're, you're unfolding here. Yeah, exactly. And you know what's his mm -hmm. actual evidence for this? Nothing. Yeah, exactly. Nothing. exactly. There's one philosopher by the name of Ross Parker who made a very good argument when responding to Schellenberg regarding this point. He gave mm -hmm. a very nice example to demonstrate that some moral goods are simply incommensurable and cannot be objectively compared and contrasted in terms of how valuable they are. Here's the example that he gave. Ooh, I want to okay. read this out. Consider an instance where my four-year-old son Jacob is trying to put together a puzzle which is difficult for him to do. I can help him complete the puzzle or I can let him try to do it on his own. If I help, Jacob experiences my concern for him in a tangible way. We can have the good of working together and completing the task, and the possibility of his failing can be avoided. On the other hand, Jacob completing the puzzle without my help would be valuable for him, both intrinsically and instrumentally. For example, in increasing his confidence, completing a difficult task on his own, etc. It seems to me 
that the opposing sets of goods in this situation are such that there is not a determinate ranking of one over the other. And I would be morally justified in choosing to help or to refrain from helping. I think that something similar is the case, though obviously on a vastly larger scale, for God when deciding what general strategy to take with regard to providing evidence for his existence, or when deciding to allow a specific case of divine hiddenness. In other words, it's not immediately obvious that God choosing to immediately reveal himself to a non-resistant non-believer is better than God temporarily choosing not to in exchange for other great wisdoms and moral goods that would be actualized. Thirdly, one versus one superiority does not equals one versus collective superiority. So even if, even if, for the sake of argument alone, Schellenberg were somehow able to demonstrate why God establishing, immediately establishing a loving relationship with a non-resistant non-believer is a greater moral good compared to every other individual alternative moral good, Schellenberg would still have to demonstrate that this moral good alone is vastly greater than the accumulation of several moral goods which could be attained if yeah. God were to temporarily postpone guiding non-resistant non-believers. And, you know, we mentioned different alternative possible moral reasons for why God could temporarily postpone the guidance of non-resistant non-believers, such as respecting their moral autonomy, testing believers, um, waiting for these non-resistant non-believers to further yearn for God to have the right motives to seek God, to repent from their sins, etc. All these could be possible, simultaneous reasons. And so where does Schellenberg get the confidence to say that God immediately establishing a loving relationship with a non-resistant non-believer is yeah. evidently greater than even the sum of all these important moral goods? Schellenberg has a lot more work to do here. And until he does it, frankly, his argument is underwhelming. Fourthly, all harms to non-resistant non-believers are offset. Now, Schellenberg, in his works, talks about the harm that comes to the non-resistant non-believer during the interval when he is not in a loving relationship with God. Yep. However, two things can be said here. When it comes to the sincere truth seekers from the Ahlul Fatra, not only will any spiritual harm by being disconnected from God, if it could even be described as that, that they, yep. that they endure, will be completely eliminated, but it will also be infinitely compensated. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in an authentic hadith that even those who lived the most miserable of lives in this world, once they get a tiny dip into paradise, they will forget mm. all the hardship and distress they ever experienced in this world. It's, actually, when I first came across that hadith, I think it's in Bukhari and Muslim, it's an mm. incredibly well-attested hadith. I was just so utterly struck by it uh, and and there's nothing really comparable in, in my previous christian experience uh to compare with it um and it provided a, a powerful counter argument to you know uh you know atheist criticisms of you know the theology problem you know how, how can a good god yeah. allow evil yeah. to exist in the world when it because they don't take into account the afterlife and judgment and heaven and hell and the experience so um it, it's a very powerful hadith indeed most, most extraordinary absolutely uh, absolutely you know, the, you know, thus, I mean, uh, you know, entering hell would mean a total elimination of harm, you know, physical or emotional, that would have been experienced. Yeah. Secondly, being granted everlasting paradise in exchange for what is comparatively an infinitesimal period of spiritual inconvenience is yeah. more than any just compensation that could be demanded. So, for Schellenberg to make this argument that the individual was harmed by God's temporary hiddenness from him really boils down to nothing ultimately. Yeah. <clears throat> now we come to the second presumption. What was the second presumption? 
the second assumption. The second assumption was non-resistance entails that this is both the ideal and required time for God to guide the non-believer by entering into a relationship with him. Yeah. Now, stance is problematic. You know, first of all, it is inconsistently applied. It is inconsistently applied to God's attributes. When we say that God is perfectly just, no theologian understands by this that God must instantly enact his justice once a crime is committed. When we say that God is perfectly merciful or forgiving, that does not mean that God instantly forgives. This instantaneous aspect that Schellenberg emphasizes so much neglects yeah. to consider that other relevant factors in addition to non-resistance must be present, which takes me to my second point. Non-resistance isn't all that matters. As mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, someone can be non-resistant yet still be morally culpable and blameworthy in failing to actually strive to sincerely seek the truth. Let's try to draw a human analogy here. Can we say that we human beings develop loving relationships with people as long as they don't hate us or treat us badly? Hmm. Well, you know, of course not. We don't form loving bonds with strangers on the street simply because they don't resist us by, you know, by hating us or, or opposing us. A loving relationship must have some sort of basis, be it shared blood ties or spiritual ties, like how Muslims are supposed to love each other, close friendships, and so on. Yeah. There must be some reason. It cannot be neutral. Non-resistance to God is not necessarily a positive attitude to God. It could be neutral or ambivalent. It can be apathetic about God. We mentioned earlier that kufr al-i'rad, or apathyism, is a serious mode of kufr. So yeah. to say that God is expected to love such people is unwarranted, mm -hmm. which you know takes me to my third point. It arbitrarily defines what perfect love entails. Yep. Schellenberg tries to argue that God's love should be greater than any sort of love we can imagine. And so he brings in the mother analogy, whereby a mother does her utmost to spare her children of any unneeded harm and never deprives them of her love. Yeah. But there are limitations to this analogy. First and foremost, first and foremost, the analogy even breaks down according to Schellenberg's own criteria. Schellenberg says, and this is where he departs from Christianity a bit. Schellenberg says that God is not expected to love people who resist. Yet many mothers still love their children who are not obedient to them and disrespect them and abandon them. So even according to Schellenberg's own criteria, a mother's love for her child appears to be greater than God's if, you know, if Schellenberg were to be <laughs> consistent. But the fact of the matter is that no created being can ever outpace God in love. Whereas Ibn Taymiyyah got, you know, argued, God is the source of all love on earth. He created the love our mothers have for us. He instilled in them the emotional capacity and inclination to love us in the manner that they do. Moreover, loving perfectly does not translate into loving unconditionally, just as perfect forgiveness does not translate into unconditionally forgiving others. God's attributes have to complement each other. Love can be irrational at times. When not checked properly, it could actually prevent us from judging and treating people justly. It can also prevent right. people from achieving other important objectives that they wish to or must. But God is not like that. He has other objectives he seeks to actualize. He has other attributes that must perfectly complement his attribute of love. And this takes me to my fourth point. Schellenberg's concept of perfect divine love hinders God from doing things that are not conceptually impossible and thus compromises his omnipotence. 
According to Schellenberg, it is impossible for God to create human beings who sincerely seek him and gives them time to do so before he guides them. Something so basic as that is impossible for God, according to Schellenberg. And this has now pretty much opened the door to criticizing the widely accepted idea that God is perfectly powerful enough to do anything that isn't a logical contradiction. So, you know, and Schellenberg insists that a person being non-resistant is the ideal time for God to guide him. But ideal for whom? It may not be ideal for God if his plan is that he creates human beings to strive to seek religious truth, which entails that guidance is not necessarily instant and could take some time. So this whole idea of being the ideal time for guidance is just arbitrarily being determined by Schellenberg without any objective basis. For a state of affairs to be ideal, it ought to be in a certain way to achieve a predefined objective. But perhaps that objective is God testing people by giving them freedom to sincerely investigate religious truth in a process that <laughs> is fine. So yeah. to deny that this can be the objective is simply question begging. So in conclusion, we see that Schellenberg's argument rests on two major claims. The first is that perfect divine love must be understood as God instantly establishing a loving relationship with anyone who is not intentionally rejecting him. <clears throat> I demonstrated that this reasoning is flawed and inconsistent as we do not understand any of God's other attributes, such as justice and mercy, as having this instantaneous actualization aspect to them. And we saw that there are many good reasons for why God would temporarily postpone the guidance of individuals, even if they do not actively resist God. And I've also shown that Schellenberg's claim that these reasons aren't good enough is not only baseless reasoning, but highly implausible as well. And the second claim of Schellenberg rests on the assumption that non-resistance is sufficient reason for God, for, for, for God to guide and establish a relationship with someone. But this is poorly thought through. As mere non-resistance isn't enough to establish a relationship. There needs to be an appropriate level of desire from both parties in order for that to occur. Moreover, to restrict God's ability to temporarily postpone the guidance of non-resistant people is a severe restriction of his freedom and calls into question his omnipotence, which is theologically problematic. So all in all, all in all, Schellenberg's argument is highly contentious and it makes critical assumptions that are question begging and demand a greater level of evidence for their veracity. And so in a nutshell, this is not an argument that ought to worry theists, let alone Muslims. And so with that, I conclude my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. If you come back to the main screen again. Yeah. Um, now that was a, a fascinating um, and very surgical deconstruction of uh, Schellenberg's uh, philosophy. I, I, I was struck by the artificiality of uh, Schellenberg's arguments and the seeming arbitrary assumptions that he had built in in the in the premises uh, in assumptions. Um, you know, uh, but which but were clearly borrowed from the environment he's in. Can you said he was Canadian, so you know historically it's a Christian country. Uh, and and the kind of uh, the assumptions were very Christianized in, in in character. So even though he's an atheist, he's thinking just as a philosopher. He's actually borrowing from his milieu, his cultural milieu, certain ideas that God is love. It's just that God, often Christian expressed idea. I mean, is there in one John in the New Testament? God is love, and that's it. You know, <laughs> yeah, thinking yeah. whoa. I mean, if you read the Gospels, 
um that's not what jesus says you know he, he warns about hellfire and in fact he jesus warns more about the dangers of hellfire and judgment than anyone else in the entire bible christian bible old and new testament combined um you know the afterlife heaven and hell yes god is a god of love but he's also god of holiness of judgment uh and so on and so all of that is lost in this kind of later um almost saccharine sentimental sort of conception of god as just loving uh, what i think of as a kind of grandfathery kind of conception of god a god who just dotes and loves and is beneficent and kind and loving and that's it you know <laughs> you yeah. never seen it. he would never actually yeah you know, how then do you of course this is a recipe for atheism in a way because if you then just open the newspapers and watch the news and you see what's happening in turkey i mean i just had my went to the barbers earlier and and it was a turkish you know and all they had was a tv screen just showing i think it was like thirty five thousand people have just died uh that's yeah. the latest estimates anyway i mean and they're still getting people digging people out now um you know how does this conception of god deal with that uh the the, the idea of a purely loving sentimental god it can't it breaks down because it makes a mockery of of, of god so the, but you, as you introduced and you mentioned that particular hadith uh, and there are many others that speak to uh the problem of the so-called problem of evil which is really a christian problem actually it's not really an islamic problem at all so um yeah the, the argument is, is very artificial and unsatisfactory clearly has cultural roots in a christian cult context but even then a very simplified sentimentalized christian conception of the divine uh but no but credit to you basem for going through the 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 philosophical rigor of his arguments questioning the assumptions analyzing what he's saying uh, and you know demonstrating uh the, the inadequacies of, of of his argument and i think you did it very well so thank you thank you so much appreciate it um i think that is that it is there anything else you wanted to say or we um, no um, uh, um, um that's it that's it, from that's my it? Side. okay so, well yeah. i would just uh thank you uh, i would just repeat then as i said at the beginning uh that i will put links to your platforms basam which are definitely Great. worth following um you do you produce some I'm not just saying this, you produce some outstanding quality content on an incredibly regular basis. I don't know where you find the time and the energy to do it, but you do so. Uh, so uh, Bassam is definitely worth following um, if you want more of this high quality uh, intellectual engagement with a whole range of issues, uh, Islam and uh, theology and philosophy uh, and uh, other religions as well. So um, I'll put that in the description below. So thank you very much, Bassam. Until next time. Thanks a lot, Paul. Take care of yourself. Salam alaikum.